Michael Bohm, uh, youth apologetics training, and uh, he's been doing his podcast covering a slew of different mm -hmm. topics related to apologetics for a number of years. And uh, now he has taken on a role as a teaching pastor, I guess you could call it, of Calvary Chapel in Berthid, Colorado. And so I'm glad to have him on my channel and we have Jason Oaks, Pastor Jason Oaks of Emmanuel Baptist Church in Roundup, Montana, also of People of the Free Gift. He has a YouTube channel, um, a lot of good stuff coming from Jason's side uh, of the fence. And so, yeah, today we're going to be talking about um, different ways that some of the cults twist um, common terminology, common um, scriptures that we, you know, we all hold dear. We read them out of our Bible, and then we hear somebody from the cults that will take that very same scripture and come up with something completely different from it. Um, clearly, obviously, not using good hermeneutics, not using good context and, and science of interpretation, and rather they'll just find what they want to find. They will isogeet. They'll take their concepts and squish them into the Bible versus taking what the authors intended and pulling it out. So yeah, that is our topic for today. Um, we've already done a whole podcast on the Mormons. So, uh, and, and although we haven't, we didn't really talk about Joseph Smith's translation when we did that podcast. No, we did not. Okay, uh, what we so, were talking about is one <clears throat> end of scripture twisting uh, where they twist it by redefining or uh, reinterpreting common passages or taking really obscure passages and making them into a full-blown doctrine. Right, and right. So we did that with the Mormons, but this time what we're doing that's a little bit different is we're taking the actual other translations that have been created by these groups and taking a look at those and how they are intentionally uh, using different words. And it's subtle in many different ways. And if you didn't know kind of that key terminology, you wouldn't see how they're just sliding their way of looking at things right into the scripture. Yeah, right, right. So, um, gosh, who do we want to talk about first? I guess we could just jump right in and talk about uh, the Joseph Smith translation since we've kind of started there. Um, okay. Tell me, yeah, what kinds of things have you found? Well, you know, I haven't had a, a really good chance to dive into, but uh, if you look right behind me, I have a couple of my copies in various forms. Um, and so one of the things that I did want to point out is it takes a lot of guts to actually write yourself into the Bible. And that's exactly what Joseph Smith did. Now, I, I do want to show you uh, this one version that I have here, if you kind of look, and for your listeners, you're listening, but um, Michael, you can see on the screen how mm -hmm. words are just completely crossed out or you have things that are added in. Uh -huh. And if you go uh, to Temple Square and right across the street, they have the LDS Church History Museum and they have under glass um, a copy of what it's similar. It's not the actual one he's using or anything, but to give you an idea, and it's just basically that, where you see him is writing in the margins, and you see words crossed out. Now, I'm going to show you another thing. This is Genesis 50. Okay. Now, you see how the King James is right next to it, and it ends right here? Okay. This... <laughs> is oh what, my goodness this is why he added now in that let me read you something and it goes on uh <clears throat> this is also uh in second nephi 3 conveniently sure and this is genesis 50 33 in the joseph smith translation and that seer will i bless and they that seek to destroy him shall be confounded. For this promise I give unto you, for I will remember you from generation to generation, and his name shall be called Joseph. And it shall be after the name of his father, 
And he shall be like unto you, for the thing which the Lord shall bring forth by his hand shall bring my people unto salvation. And the Lord swear unto Joseph that he would preserve his seed forever, saying, I will raise up Moses, and a rod shall be in his hand, and she, he shall gather together my people, and he shall lead them as a flock, and he shall smite the waters of the Red Sea with his rod. Now, none of that is in any manuscript, any translation other than this. But uh, if you know Joseph Smith Jr., mm -hmm. named after his dad, Joseph Smith Sr., and this is a prophecy. You ask any Mormon who is this talking about, either from this or Second Nephi 3, well, of course, that's a prophecy of Joseph Smith. That takes a lot of guts. Yeah. I, I, I mean, that tells me, well, that suggests to me that he's, I shouldn't even go there, that he's not even a believer. If you don't have that kind of fear of the Lord and, and you're okay with just adding to the Bible, of course, um, as we're going to talk about, there's so many movements now, nowadays that feel like they're hearing the voice of the Lord. And so I guess um, when, you're, when you're convinced that God is speaking to you, um, there, there's really no limits to what kind of ideas you might have popping into your head. Um, as as uh, what Han Solo would say, you're getting delusions of grandeur. So um, <laughs> we had to bring in Star Wars somehow. I yeah, mean, yeah. Along with the Yoda shirt. <laughs> um, well, the thing is uh, with Joseph Smith, and I, from my research with a lot of these founders, of these groups and you've done podcast um on a lot of them seven day adventist mm -hmm. Jehovah's witnesses uh their founders the ones who really had the i i guess the guts the courage to the whatever you would call it to actually claim that they're speaking for god and they're bringing forth this fresh revelation. And it's not something that like God wants to bless you like you hear so often today, but it's really like doctrinal changing things that a lot of these, if you go into the accounts of when they're having these revelations, you find some really scary stuff. Like uh, Joseph Smith, the night that he, had the visit from Moroni happened to be on the night of the autumn equinox. And he happened to practice witchcraft and money digging and all this stuff. And mm -hmm. Jupiter talisman to on him to the day of his death. And so I have to believe, honestly, when I look at things objectively with Joseph Smith, that he really was being visited by these uh, beings and that he was being communicated with uh, and there was a level in which early on it was a lot more subtle in terms of the changes that he was introducing but later on he really I think maybe at a certain point it went to his head and that's when he started like running for president and leading the largest steady militia in the U.S. and all of these things that eventually got him killed. Um, and the revelations, a lot of the really crazy, crazier, at least sounding to us, things, those things happened very shortly before his death. That's fascinating. Okay, so, um, and, and, and I'm certainly not as much of an expert in this area as you. I have always waffled between was Joseph Smith more of, pardon me for all those who are part of the Mormon faith, but more of like a huckster who mm -hmm. was just coming up with a new faith to make some money and mm -hmm. potentially have a whole bunch of wives, okay? Or was there an occult component to it that um, he was getting these ideas from the spirit realm, from some kind of demonic source? And... Um, when you look at the birth of most of the cults, you do see a demonic component. Uh, I mean, certainly outside of the world of the cults, you have um, uh, uh, Muhammad, 
okay, yeah. who was visited by Gabriel, and he would, uh, Mohammed would fall down and have these seizures, and then come to and have all these new revelations. Uh, certainly, this was not the angel Gabriel, but that's what's claimed. Yeah. And uh, so, okay, so, and, and we do know Joseph Smith, uh, he was, he was taking part in all kinds of occult practices. There was the, the, the treasure digging that he would right. do. There was the fact that he was uh, most certainly involved with the Masons. Yes. Uh, and all of that occult uh, happenings that they would, they take part in. Uh, in fact, he incorporated all the secret handshakes and, and a lot of the hand signs and even some of the passwords that you find in Masonry are also found in the, in the Mormon church. So interesting. Uh, Okay. And, and what's with the Jupiter talisman? I've never heard that before. Uh, yeah. I mean, he, he wore that. Uh, it was found on him when he, when he was killed. And okay. uh, he was crying out the Masonic uh, cry for help. Yeah. The, the, what was it? The, um... you know, uh, is there any help for the, the widow's <laughs> son? The widow's son. Yeah, there it is. Yeah. Um, and, you know, you could see his gun uh at that that museum i mentioned earlier um oh the gun that he had when he was a martyr yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly, yeah. <laughs> I, I, 